So, uh, we will continue today with a Python lecture. Uh, I will also uh, just repeat something about loops here we did just last time here. So, if we have a loop, like we have here, we have a looping from 0 to 19. Uh, there are two keywords, a statement that you can use that are um, that you can control the loop. So there is the first one is break, and that statement will exit the loop and continue after the loop. Uh, and then also you have continue, which will go to the next iteration of the loop. So it will go from this point here and go back here and start executing from this part. So using continue, it will not go to the print statement here. So running this example here, you can see here that when we come to uh, position five, it says go to the next iteration. It will not print out number five. So then we continue. And if, when we arrive at i equals to 10, we do a break. And then we skip all the other iterations and go directly to, to row number 10 here. So we stop there. So you should perhaps try to avoid using this, these constructs excessively because it makes your code a bit unreadable. Um, so let's see here, continue. You can do the, these are tasks that you can complete on your own as you, as you want as well. We'll continue to functions and subroutines. So up until now, uh, you have been working with uh, code executing one by one. Uh, and when your program gets larger, you need to kind of group them together to be able to handle, um, lock them together in, in logical parts that you can debug separately. And, and what you do then is you, you put your code into functions. Uh, and functions in Python are defined by the keyword def for define. Uh, after define keyword, you put the name of the function. So in this case here, I do print doc is the function name. And this function doesn't have any parameters. It's only have, it's just, uh, it does only execute some action. You can't uh, put some parameters because the brackets are empty. And then there is the same principle as we had before. Uh, colon means a code block. And then the next line will be indented. So all the statements belonging to the function must be indented. So you can see here, the print statement here is indented here and it belongs to the print statement, print doc function. So, but just executing this code doesn't do anything. So what it does, it actually tells Python to define this function and save it for later. So it's stored in memory now. If you want to use the function, you just uh, give the name of the function and the parentheses and it will call this function. Uh, functions without any parameters is probably very, not always useful. You probably want to give a function some input parameters so that you can, the function can do different things depending on the input you give it to. So it's very similar here. Do you just add in the parentheses the, the variable parameters that you want to pass to the function. In this case, I only have a single one, a, and it is defined as a variable in Python. So in your function, you can use this variable um, and uh, in different ways. So in this case here, I define print value function and that should print out the value of a. And then when I run this, I define a parameter b here. And, and the B parameter here uh, can have a different name. You don't have to have give the function the same variable name as the function parameter. So in this case, B will be the A value when it comes in, goes into the function. Another thing to be aware of is that you can't 
change of value coming into function. So in, in the case here, uh, if we try to modify A here, A is, uh, will become a local variable. It doesn't change the value coming in. It just changes the value local in the function. It's completely fine to do this, uh, but just be aware that if you do this, the value will not be, um, you, you will lose the reference to the incoming variable. But it's, it's so okay to code to do that. So if we define this one and run it, you will see still that uh, B is still 42. So we haven't changed anything and that's by purpose. So most parameters you pass to Python is by, by value, not by, by reference. All, all functions in Python can return values as well. So for example, you can define a, a math function here, f of x, and then you can do, use return to return the value of a expression of some kind. Uh, and then you can use the function like this. So in this case, I define x here and I call x and assign y the, the value of the function call. So the return will actually be assigned the left side. Uh, you can also return multiple values, like you see here. You have two values here are returned. Then I also have to be have two values on the left side here. Yep. I have a question regarding placement of the function. For example, in MATLAB, you have to find the function at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You want to call them at the top. Uh, Python, you have to, have to define the function. First, call them. yes. So uh, when, you have, when you write your source code file, the Python file, uh, usually you place the functions first and then you have your code. Uh, I would go into how you should create some kind of main function in your module as well, but on your source code. But usually the code executes from the beginning. So the function has to be defined before you can use it. So in this case here, uh, if we run this, so it assigns X and Y from these values here. However, you, you need to be aware that you can't skip. For example, if I skip this value and just do this and run this, uh, you will see you will get out a pair here instead. So uh, it returns you this uh, uh, read only list. Well, I forgot the name now, but uh, from, from, from the return function. So then X is not the value, it's a, it's a pair. Uh, you can also pass lists into a function. So, uh, and in this case, you actually can modify the values inside a list. So the variable, the, the B is a variable that comes in. So you call it and you submit a list into that. And as you know, the contents of the list are references to other values. So if you modify a value inside a list, it will actually modify the value outside the list as well. So this is a, exception to the case here that you can't modify values of the incoming parameters. Uh, when you have list, you can do that. So in this case, you can see here that A is actually modified. So here, if you, if you have a computer or uh, you don't have computers, all of you, <laughs> Uh, but what, what you can do, there is a task here. Uh, you can think about how to implement the function above here. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think yeah. about that, how you should implement that in Python.
So when you want to enter something, you can enter the code in the box and then you press play and it will actually, you can test it out. So any suggestions? Yeah. What do I have to do in the first line? It did it automatically here, indent. Then we need to return the expression. So return, then we have two times X. And then raise two is, is uh, two uh, multiplication uh, operator. Like this. So we define it. So if we just want to call it as well, we can just do a line here below. And then we do um, y equals to f of 2 times 0. And then we print y. So this is how you define a function. So now I have to remove this, otherwise the solution is there. Um, yes. So next part here. So now we have a lot of Python code. We have a, up until now, you probably have written your files in a, in a single source code file called .py with an extension. Um, we can, or, in Python, you can organize your code in, uh, in several ways. But the easiest one is actually uh, just dividing up your code in different source code files. So every source code file in Python is something called a module. So you can import a module source code file and make the, the functions available inside that module available to you automatically. Uh, and you all have been using this perhaps in some of the code here. For example, if I want to use the math function in Python, I do import math. That loads this math module into my current environment. So it's, the functions are available. Uh, and then you can call, for example, math.scene here. So in, in this math module, there is a scene function that you can call. And there is also a pi here available for, for the pi. So when you do import in this form, uh, you need to prefix all the functions with the module name. So in certain ways, certain situations, this is preferable because you many modules could have the same function names. By using this import way, you can, you can make sure that you're calling the right function for the right module. However, when you want to write math expressions, uh, it can be a bit complicated to prefix everything with math. So there is a second way of importing thing. You can do this instead. So from math import star, that will import all the functions in math into your current environment. And then they're available directly to you. Uh, and in this case, you can just do scene pi divided by two. Works the same way. So from some certain situations, you can do that, the one form or the other one, but the preferable form is the one that I showed before here that you do import math. Uh, you can also, if you only want sim single functions inside a module, you can also specify them. So in this case, from math import sin and square root, these are the only functions that will be available to me. So all other functions are not imported. Sometimes the, the star import form is slow because it will parse the module and import all these functions and place them inside your own uh, uh, environment. And the cool thing with Python now is that you can create your own modules. So just by placing a file in your source code directory, automatically becomes a module. So the name of your file without extension is your module name. Uh, so for example here, I want to create a module here, place this code here into a uh, source code file. I have a function here called is prime that will test if a number is a prime number. Uh, I use the math module here, square root. Uh, now, because this is a notebook, it's a diff bit difficult to do this. Uh, so I will download a file here, um, prime.py. So I have a prime.py in my directory. If I want to use this in my 
Python code, I can do import prime. So now the functions inside prime is available to me and they're available uh, by the prefix notation. So I need to do prime is prime. So in this case here, it will be, uh, the, the function will be called, but you have to prefix it with the module name. And it seemed to work. So it's very easy to structure your code. Just place them in separate files. You can copy them between the files and then you have your modules. And it's a, it's a convenient way of, of uh, grouping your things together. And also try to avoid having a single source code file 30,000 lines long. Divide it up into logical entities and logical functionality. I, I would say that that is the, uh, it's so easy in Python to do that. Uh, but something you have to be aware of is that the module, when you import it, will execute all the code in that module. So if you have code that prints out stuff and you do an import, it will actually print out stuff. Um, so you need to kind of differentiate between main, main, your main program code and the module code. So modules that you should have basically only functions and classes defined. And then you should have a main, main module script that starts your code running and imports the modules. Uh, so I have this module here, prime. And you can see here, I added a print statement here uh, that uh, will be used when I call the module. Uh, so I will download this version here. So this is a source code for prime extra.py. And I will download that one here. So this is a prime main function. Uh, so if I do import just like this, you can see here that it prints out prime extra. So if you look at the code here, I have this print name here. So the underscore underscore name, that is a special variable that is set by Python in the module. So it gives, if you import, name will be the name of the module. However, you can also execute the code. When you press play in, in your uh, Python environment, you will execute the code. And that is not the same thing as importing it. And if you, uh, so if I run, run here is a way of, it's the same thing if you in Spider press play, it will execute prime extra as a, uh, as a run, running the Python file. And now you can see it prints main instead. So when, when you start executing a Python script using play or by typing Python prime extra dot pi or run prime extra, it will treat it as the main script. That is the starting point of your program. Uh, and uh, you can use this information here to create something called a main function. So what you do then is in your main file, but which starts your program. You import your modules like import prime here, but then you have an if statement here. So if name equals to main, then we know, so if this statement is true, we know that this script has been started by pressing run or running it, not by importing it. So in this case, okay, we know we are the main script. So what should I do? I should print out the prime, uh, the, call the function prime is prime on six and five. That is my main script. Uh, but I can also import this. So if I import the same file as a module, this code would not be called. So you can have modules that can be both imported, but also started as main script. So this part here will only be called when it's run as a main script. So when it's run as, when you do type Python on the command line with your source code file, if you press run in spider, it will be main. And then this will be called. But if you import prime main as a module, this part will not be called. So you will probably see this in many of my examples, you will get in the course that there is an if name equals to main in many of the files. And that, that means that this is a main program the starting point of the code. So you can see here, if we run prime main here, 
we can see here, it will call this function and we return false in the first one and true in the second one. But if I now do import prime main, like a module, nothing will happen. If I di didn't have this if name main, the second part will also call the print and print out the, the prime number calculations. So this is a way of uh, many other languages like for example, C and have a main function that starts your code running. Python really doesn't have that. So if you have a source code file and just print something in it and run it, it will run. But, some, but in many cases you need to kind of differentiate between running and importing. And this is the way you do it. So next part here that I want to talk about is uh, actually a really important thing, how you actually print the percent data uh, now in, in, in a text form basically, but uh, usually when it comes to floating point numbers and things you can calculate, you have a, you need to present it with a certain number of decimal points. You perhaps, you don't, you want to have it in a scientific uh, notation. Uh, you need it to be in a table form with certain spaces. Uh, you can do this, and, and this is done by using uh, something called formatting strings in Python. And especially there is a special method on the string. If you see here, this is a normal string in Python, but you can add, because a string is an object, has a, a lot of method you can call on the string. There is a method called format. And format can place var uh, variables you have in this template. So variable A will go in the first position here, B in the second, C in the third, and D in the fourth. So those curly brackets will, will be removed. The comma signs will be left. So you can th think of this as a template on how you want to print out stuff. So you can see here now when I run this, it will take number two and place it first and so on. And the print out like that. This is not so much different than you're doing a normal print with just the parameters after it, but you have more options here. So the first thing you can do with the former statements is actually rearranging the order. You can have a template here saying that I want A to go here, B to go there, and so, so they reverse it. So by just by, by changing this template, you don't have to change this, but you can change the template and the output will be different. So now you see the ordering is different. Uh, you can do a lot more things. So for example, if you, if you have a, um, you want to print something that should be 50 characters wide and you want to center it in, in that um, width, you can do that as well. So you have, here you have a, those first characters just for illustration, curly back to colon 15, that is the, the field width. So the, the, the number of characters I want to use for printing out this screen. So if we run this, you can see here, this will be 15 characters, starting here, ending there, and it's left justified. You can also change the justification. So if you want to have it on the right side instead, you can have a add a Add a greater than sign here that will right justify the string. So now it should print on the right side. What is the wrong side here? <laughs> Not the right side. But you can also center. So if you can manage to get, <coughs> get this character here, that means that the string is centered in the field width. So <coughs> now it's in the middle. Uh, there's also a way of, uh, if you want to have, instead of filling with spaces, which is the default, you can fill with uh, a character of your choice. So for example, if instead of having spaces here, I can have underscores. So I have an underscore, centered, 15 characters wide, and then my screen here again. 
you can see here, it, it fills out with underscores and stuff. <clears throat> so that was string formatting. Uh, and now we build upon that to, to format integers, floating points in different ways. So integers, um, you use the character D, which re represents an uh, integer. Um, this is not so very exciting, just prints 42 with no formatting. This is basically what you get when you print without formatting. But then we can do a lot more here. So same thing here. Imagine that you want to write a ta table with columns of different width. And then you would like to have, a, uh, you want, would like to have the 42 to have a certain width. And the first one here, so we have a field is 10 and you can place the, the integer on the left side. And then you can have the same thing that we use with strings, uh, right justified, left justified, centered and filled with underscores. So now you see the same thing here. One, one thing you could do with the last one here, I can add one here, which is, for example, if you want to have a prefix it with zeros, so we do it uh, justified zero like this. Okay, I need to correct it so like this. So you can see if I do errors, it will be quite explicit about what the, so it said unexpected end of file is E off while parsing. So it expected something to come there like a parenthesis, it didn't. And then you get this kind of typical error, syntax error, unexpected end of file. So now here, you can have zeros here instead. If you want to have a numbering up to 001, 002 and so on, you can, you can fill it out with zeros as well. It's possible to have a floating numbers. There's oh, next section here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so you need to specify formatting either of integer or a floating point. You can't kind of mix. It has to be uh, D for integers. And and, that, and then there are several characters of floating point. So the first one is uh, the fixed notation uh, using the F character here. Then you specify the field width and the number of decimals you want. So 10.2 that says 10 characters with two decimals. 10.4 is 10 characters wide and four. The same kind of uh, right left justification can work with this as one as well. You can of course add the, the, the greater than less than to uh, left and right justify them as well. It's also possible to use scientific notation. So then you use the E. So then it, you use the same field width and also the same number of decimals here. Um, name placeholders. So uh, you can expand the formatting statements even further. So uh, I can name my variables here and use them with the names in the template. So if I want X to go there, and the Y variable to go there, I just put X and Y in the template string. And then I pass over X and Y and it will replace it at templates. You can also use, um, so for example, if you have a dictionary here with named values, uh, you can actually use these value names here, the keys in the template. And then you have to specify, this is a really weird syntax. If you pass the parameters into the format state, it has to be have two stars here, two uh, application sign char characters and then parents. And then it will take this one and place it in the right place. Like that. Um, as I said before, in Python, everything is an object. Um, 
you can you can actually retrieve all variables in Python in a certain or get the dictionary of all the variables in Python using a function called globals. So globals will list you a huge list here. Uh, and I think it's so long that we can't see it here. Uh, all the functions and all the variables inside my current execution environment. And then, um, sorry, I just want to mute here. So we can use this dictionary. The, the fact that all variables are stored in a dictionary can be used actually to simplify our templating a lot. So in this case here, uh, we have uh, our values here with the time of variables. And we can just pass the globals here, but then we can use the variable names here in the template. So you can see here, it will pick up the variables that are part of the global context of variables that you have defined. So you don't have to actually pass anything, you can just do format globals. I would say that you should perhaps uh, be more explicit in your function, but that, that is a way you can do it. So also interesting, the, the globals the dictionary, you can actually modify that dictionary by using the same notation you learned yesterday. You put globals brackets and then the name of variables and you can change it. So Python is a very dynamic language that's all the data structures defined in Python are a dictionary. And you can, even a clause and a function is a dictionary. So you can modify the code when you're running as well. So next uh, important part of actually uh, many of many computational codes is to be able to read input, for example, and write output. And the reason I, I go through the formatting is because you need to, when you are done a calculation, you need to do print out your results in a way that is comprehensible for people. So it has to be able to read. And you also have to read data in to be able to, for your computation to take input to your calculation as well. So your program will be flexible and not only uh, have fixed parameters in your source code, but it can read from a file and read the input data and run your code. So writing to a file, uh, we'll talk about text files here. So basically what you can open in Notepad. Um, so what you do to be able to write a file, you need to create a connection between a file in your computer to an object in Python, which you can operate on. So, and you do that with open statement. So you have text file here is a, a object here we use to uh, communicate and write to the file. You can you create this object by using open. The first parameter here is the, the file name you want to use. And if you write it like this, it will create a file where you're running your script. So in the same directory as you're running your script. The second parameter here is what you want to do with the file. So W stands for write. So now you open an object here, but you can write too. If there would be another file on disk, it will be overwritten. So doing this, it has some, uh, it will overwrite the file and write a series out. So now we have a link to text file. And now we, so we have to, have to run this. Now we created this link. I can use this object to write, uh, write to, the, to the file. And I use a method on this object called write, quite obvious, but uh, it's not the same as print. So print, printed the line and went to the next line. With write, you write to the file and it will stop writing at this point. And if you continue to write, it will continue writing here until you come to, to a new line character. This will break to the next line and continue here. So regardless of many write you have, it will continue writing sequentially until you have uh, line breaks like this. So let's run this. An important thing, when you're done with your file, you need to tell the operating system, I have finished writing to this file because uh, both Linux and Mac and Windows have a lot of sophisticated ways of making it fast to write files. But and what they do is they cache it in memory. And so you don't have to wait for the file to be written. But however, you have to indicate to 
to Windows, for example, that I'm done writing to this file. And that, that I do with close. That signals the operating system, we are done with a file and it can write it down to disk. So nothing happened when I do that. But now I can just print out my file. And let's see what we it contains now. So this is, you see here that it's, it was only here it bro broke line. So these, this line here is two write statements. And there is a new line here. And this is the, is the last write statement. Reading from a file is very similar. You need to create the file object. Uh, but instead of writing, you do read here. But it tells the operator, I want to read from this file. And now we have many options here. Uh, the very naive and simple solution is to just read everything. And there is a method here called read. It reads the entire file and places it on a string. So content here is a string that will have the entire contents of the file. Then I close it. Okay, I need to write, execute that as one. You so I didn't open the file. So the text file was not open. That's why it didn't work. So now you can see when I print it out, it prints out the contents of the file. Problem with this, this is when you have a file that is several gigabytes long, you won't, don't want to write, store that in a string in Python. You need to kind of handle that in a better way. So read can be done, used for smaller files, uh, but not for big files. We need to figure out another method to reading from larger files. So we can do it in a different way. So we open the file again. Then there is a method called read line. And it reads a single line from the file. So basically until the end of line character and stores that in a string. And, and if you are at the end of the file, a line will be an empty string. So we can use that to while line is not equal to an empty string. We continue reading from the file by continuously calling read line. We get a new line all the time. And then we are done, we can do file close. So you can see here that, just to illustrate that I put, I put a greater than sign here and then printed line. And you can see it printed the first line, the second line. But then here is a bit of mystery. Why is there an extra line between those? Why is those not written directly after each other? The, uh, the empty line. Sorry? It ignores the empty line. Uh, there is no empty line in the file. The file consists of two lines. So when I read it and printed out, to say I got this space between. And it, the reason for that is when you read line, it will read the end line character and store that in the string as well. When you do print, print will automatically add an end line to the string when it prints. So this print statement will print first line with an end line and then add an end line. So you will get this line and an, an extra line here. So that's why. If we are not interested in the end line or the, the, the new line character in the string, we can modify it a bit more. So we do read line here, but we tell Python strip the lost character. We don't, we're not interested in the new line character in the string. So this will just remove the last character. Same thing here. Now we will not have the new line character in the string. We will have just a string. And now they are on the same. So now we don't have that space between. So this is a good way of using the R strip function I told you about yesterday. So that will remove uh, any trailing spaces or new lines of this, from the string. So you just get a clean string ready. Um, but there's, uh, of course, in Python, you can do things in multiple ways. So there is, of course, another way you can do read file. You can actually use the for statement to read. The file. So we open the file again, and we do for line in text file. And then we can print every line here. So you can basically iterate over a text file with multiple lines by using the for statement. This is really elegant solution.
Another thing, sometimes you want to read the entire file and then process it afterwards. Perhaps you want to go back and forth in the file, not process it sequentially, uh, but do it more randomly. You can use the read lines method that will read every line and store it in the list. So every line is a single item in the list. And then you can, you can loop over the list or jump between different lines in the list as well. So now you can see here, I have a list here, the first line here, including the new line, of course, and then the next string here. Um, I think we take 50 minutes break and then we continue with exciting file openings. <laughs> So let's continue. So as I said before, it is important to close the files when you're done with them. And uh, to ensure that you close the file, there is a way of, you, of, of actually opening and reading files that guarantees that your file is closed. So um, one moment. My, my camera doesn't follow me, so. <laughs> uh, so guarantee that it's uh, closed. And that's using the with statement. So with open as text file. So this is basically what you did before where you assign text file with open statement. But the with statement here always calls close on, on, a, on this object here. Uh, even if you have errors or stuff like that happening in the file, this will guarantee that the file will be closed. So uh, I think this is the way you should open a file. Instead of assigning a variable, use the with statement and then do all the file operations here in this code block here underneath. So this here. Uh, very short about error handling. So it's, very, it's good when you program but you try to be defensive, program defensively. So for example, don't open files that file names that, that doesn't exist. Uh, and test for that certain thing. For example, in this here, we use a module called OS, which is an operating system module. It has a function called path exists, where you can check if the file name actually exists before you open it. And then, then you open the file. So otherwise, you print out the file and what isn't found. You kind of, kind of think of what errors can happen and kind of avoid them instead of just crashing your program. This is a way of, of doing error and you can if statements to do things, but it's sometimes hard to um, know all the errors that can occur. Uh, and you probably see when, when I when I run my program, there was an error, there was some kind of exception and there was a syntax error. Uh, and those merit messages are called exceptions. And exceptions is something that is generated by Python when something goes wrong or something unexpected happens. Um, so for example here, I have uh, I want to try to open this myfield.txt. It doesn't exist. So when I run this, you can see here that uh, I get an error here. But if you look closely here, you can see that it says file not found error in a certain format. Um, and this, this here is an exception object. So when you, the, the file is found, there is an exception called file not found. And it also prints out here what the actual problem is. Uh, it was also points at the row where it's happening. You can catch these exceptions. So, and you catch them by using a construct called try and accept. You start with try. So it's, it's something like, so just try doing this. So try opening this file here. If something happens, go here, accept. So when you have an exception in this code, it will execute this, this line of code instead. 
let's see what happens here. Now you see there was not a ugly error message. Uh, there was an exception because this file doesn't exist. So it jumped down here and just printed out the file couldn't open. There is a big problem with this code. It catches every exception. So if something else goes wrong here, if, if it's uh, there's a permission errors, for example, you're not allowed to read this file. You still get an exception and it will print the same thing, but it's not correct. So this is a catch all exception uh, handler. So we need to be more precise in many cases to actually only catch the exceptions we want. So we know that we, we, we had a file not found exception. So we can do like this instead. So try file not found error except. In this case, it will only catch this exception, nothing else. And you can have a list of exceptions that you want to catch as well. So you can just continue on and it will go in there and catch those. And in the case when you don't have permissions to access the file, you can add another exception here, permission error. And then we can print out a different error message. And much of the Python code is designed around exceptions. So most of the functions in Python send exceptions and you can catch them in different ways. You can also get some more information about except exceptions are actually objects in Python. So you, you, can, you can think of them as uh, a bag of things you send along. So here's an error and all the information is this, this bag. So in this case here, I have final found exception as E. And then I can, from this E object here, I can get the file name here. Couldn't open this file here. So you, you get some additional information. You can also get here from the permission error, you can get a string here. Uh, with the actual error message. So now you can see instead of, I actually queried exception, which file could you, couldn't you open? Uh, there is also um, certain cases when you have error in your code, uh, even if you have an error, you need to crash or stop your program execution. You want to ensure that, for example, that your files are closed or you need to do anything, some other cleanup things. You can do, use this closure. You can now try, except for handling the exceptions. And finally here, this is called um, to ensure that you close the files. So this part is always executed regardless if you have an error or not. So try except finally. So that was the first introduction to Python. There will be a more uh, second part of Python where I go through some libraries and stuff like that. But I wanted also to introduce you to uh, array handling in Python. So we will continue to an introduction to something called NumPy. Uh, as I said before, Python has a, has a lot of built-in data types that are quite powerful, like the dictionary lists, um, and, and stuff like that. But for numerical computing, where you want to process large chunks of numerical data, uh, the list is not suitable and not the dictionary either. You need to have something that is very, very efficient for that. So NumPy is a library that has been developed for several years. It came from another library called Numeric. And uh, there's also another one called Numeray. And those libraries decided to merge and create something called NumPy. And, and it's, it's an extension to handle large arrays of uh, the same data types. So blocks of floating points, blocks of integers uh, that, that are handled as a single entity. So an, an array can, can only have one data type. You can have as many uh, data, um, values as you want, but they all have the same data type. Um, it's implemented, many of these uh, extensions are implemented in C, so they're extremely fast. So multiplying through two um, uh, matrices uses uh, uh, internal C, C libraries that are extremely fast. So there is no Python looping to, to calculate the matrix multiplication. Uh, you use the NumPy library by this, this important statement here. 
And this is a, this has been kind of a convention uh, when using NumPy. So you import NumPy. Uh, if you don't just specify NumPy, you have to specify NumPy as a prefix on every function, which is a bit cumbersome. So what you do is you import NumPy as empty. So instead of writing NumPy before every function, you, you just do, do np dot. So then you know that NumPy, that is a shorthand for NumPy. And, and that is something that has been a convention when using NumPy in, in most environments. The base data structure in NumPy is array object. And uh, it, it basically handles a continuous block of memory of certain data type. Uh, you can create array objects using the array function. So you do a equals to mp dot array. Here you can give input uh, initial values. And the second part here is the data type. So in this case, I have to specify that this is a floating point data type. And I have to forget, not to forget to import this one here. Um, so if I run this, you can see if, if I print it out, it will print out the values approximately like you're doing MATLAB. Uh, if you don't specify a data type, uh, NumPy will try to figure out what the data type is. So if you, if you give a list of integers, the data type will be integer. If you give it a, a list of floating points, the data type will be floating point. So you can see here, integer arrays don't have a decimal point. Uh, floating point have a decimal point. As I said before, they can only have a si single data type. So all, all values in an array must be of the same data type. Uh, you can create multi-dimensional arrays. Then you list them. So the first row here, second row here. So it's a kind of a, a nested list in Python. Uh, here are two, so this is a two row matrix with four columns. And, and NumPy will know how to print those. So it will print them in the, the correct uh, way. So this is two rows, two rows with four columns like this. Some, something about the storage here. So. If you allocate data in a computer, you, you don't allocate two-dimensional, three-dimensional structure in a computer. You ask the, the operator says, I need 10 megabytes of floating point numbers. And that, those are stored in a single uh, row line, line like this, after each other. So the notion of two-dimensional arrays is just a construct, how to access these elements. So if you have a six rows here with five columns, this is just a way of describing for you how it's, you're supposed to jump from different parts. So you can see here it's stored uh, one, two, three, seven, nine, zero, and it goes like this. So it's stored row wise like this. Certain languages do arrays differently. So this is the way C language uses it. It stores all the two dimensional arrays uh, row wise. There is Fortran as well. They store everything column-wise. So there are two ways of doing this. Uh, we don't cover that in this course, but there is a way of creating a race and you specify which ordering you want it to, if you want column-wise or row-wise. Just know that it's basically just a single array of data. Uh, you can get some more information about arrays uh, using the the shape attribute. So here's, here you can see you have shape here. This is one dimensional here. So four elements, so two dimensional, two by two. And this is a three dimensional array structure, two by two by four. The shape gives you the shape of the array. Um, also, if you want to have uh, the number of rows and columns of an array, you can do this simple thing here. So row comma columns b equals to b dot shape. So arguably assign the first, um, this one here, and second one. So this is a quick way, quick way of uh, assigning variables for the number of rows and columns you have. 
You can also um, get the number of dimensions that you have in an array. So it's a two dimension array. Uh, there are several other attributes you can query. You have the shape, uh, the, the num number of dimensions. You can also query the actual data type, the number of elements in the array. So that's the total number, so row, rows by columns. You can also query here, this is important, for example, if you want to write data in a binary file, you can actually get the, the byte size of every element in the array. So if I run this, it was already run here, uh, you can see here that you have shape in 64. That means that the, it's an uh, integer with 64 um, bits. So basically, it's an eight bytes integer. An array size is four, so the total number of elements is one, two, three, four. Item size is eight. So every integer requires eight bytes to store. And that's why it's at each 64, that's 64 bits. So that's eight by eight is 64. Uh, you can shape, uh, um, change the shape of an array. So there's a special function called shape, reshape. Uh, and, and now I will just, this function here, you can ignore this actual here. Uh, I created a function called memory of A that displays the actual memory location of the array, uh, just to see what happens when you do reshape of things. So reshape doesn't change the actual number of elements. It can just, it changes the, so if you have a two by two, you can do a one by four. Uh, so reshape can, can be used as long as you don't change the number of elements. So here I have a two by two array with, with four elements. Uh, and then I want to reshape it. So it becomes four by one. And then it returns an A flat array like this. And then I look at what memory has A flat and what memory has A. Interesting stuff here. The memory location is 6160, 6160. So this is not a copy operation. So this is just a reinterpretation of A with four by one, so four uh, rows and one column. But the same memory. Are. So NumPy is very good at um, reusing data. So it, tries to, in every case, avoid a copy. Because you can imagine if you have large arrays, you don't want to unnecessarily make a copy to do another array because it's a, it's a costly operation. So it tries to avoid that, but you also have to be aware of that this is actually the case. If you modify A, it will modify A flat as well. So for example here, if we access uh, assign zero, zero on A to 42. Let's see what happens to A flat. Of course, I have all the output here already. Like this. So you can see here, 42 here, 42 there. So it's actually both A and A flat refers to the same memory area, the same number of elements, uh, just interpreted in a different way. And just as before, if you don't want this, if you actually want to copy, you can use the same thing as we did with this. We can use the dot copy method to, take, to create a new array object as a copy of the previous one. And now I do see 0084. And now hopefully this should be not be the same. Oops. And it seems to be very different. So this is the old A, 6160, this is 6192. So uh, they are independent. So if you don't say explicitly, I want to copy, it will try in most cases to make uh, a view of the, diff the same array again. So avoid copying at all costs. That's the kind of basic philosophy of an umpire. Because copying, if you have a array of 12,000 by 12,000, 
and you want to do a equals to b equals to a that will cost you in operations at 12,000 by 12,000 operations so that's why numpy is careful of doing copy Now here are some more examples here. So in the first case here, we do uh, a two by four array, then we do reshape eight comma, then we convert it to a one dimensional flat array like this. We can do mp dot reshape four by two, then we do like this. Uh, and note, this is not the transpose of an array. So this is just a reshape of an array. If you want to transpose, you need to do call the np.transpose method. That would actually do the uh, correct transpose of, a, of, of an array. So if you really want to change the size, you can use the resize. So reshape doesn't change the number of elements, resize does. So here I have base array again. I do a resize nine by nine. And I can do a resize here, four by four, four by two. Let's see what happens here. So here I do nine by nine. It actually keeps the numbers that we have specified. So it just repeats the existing numbers in the array. It just expands it. Uh, and if we go, here as well, this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So just repeats them in, this, in the, the new shape you created. So creating uh, arrays manually is not possible if you have really large systems. So if you have really large systems, you need to be able to pre-create an array of a certain size and then assign values to it. And if you are familiar with MATLAB, you can create an array of zeros using the zeros command. You specify the size, the shape. Uh, same thing here with the zeros. And if you want an integer, you can specify the data type there as well. So, and this can, this can be any, any size. Yeah? Is it possible to initialize an array with zeros or just two brackets? Uh, it's possible to actually, if, if you, if you need to allocate it or use it at that yeah, size, you, you, should, you should create this with zeros. Because if you make it first a small one and then, re, then you have to do a resize. Uh, now with zeros, you'd make it in one go. So if you know the size, it's better to create it up front. Um, you can also do once. So that is also very MATLAB-like. Um, same syntax here. Um, like that. And using once, you can actually pre assign things very quickly. So uh, you can do empty with once five by 10 floating point. Then you can multiply with a scalar value. And what happens now is that this multiplication, if you have an array on the left side or right side, it will multiply every element in the array with that number. So then you can create an array that is assigned, has 42 in an entire array like that. And these are fast, fast operations. So, so many of these operations I'm showing now are implemented uh, in a lower level language. So they are quite fast. You can also do array ranges. So we have shown you the range command in, in the for loop before. So you have something called a range for array range, which will create a range of numbers just like a list. Now this is actually an array consisting of sequence of numbers. And, and with this, you can actually create interesting. So using a combination of reshape, A range, you can actually create uh, arrays that count from zero to 100 and have a shape of 10 by 10. So in this case, I can create something like this. And this is not very, um, very efficient. So the A range we create the actual memory locations for hundred elements. Reshape where we interpret this array that has been created as a ten by ten array. 
So reshape doesn't actually change anything. It just it reinterprets the previous one dimensional array into two dimensional array. You can also do step lengths. So you can, you can set the starting point and the end point like this. And you can have a step here as well. However, that is sometimes it's not, I will come to another function. There is a, it's not certain that we get all the values in this here. So there is another one called lean space I will show you later on that you can generate uh, sequences that are guaranteed to have a starting endpoint in the array. Uh, you can also create identity arrays, that is arrays that have uh, one on the diagonal, like this. Also used first in linear algebra. Uh, and I come to this one here. So lean space, you can have, I want values between zero and one, and I want 10 values. And then it will inter interpolate and create a sequence of that uh, range. It's very useful if you want to do plotting, for example, plotting functions, and you want to make sure that you have the starting and end point in that sequence. So you can see here that I have 1.0, and I guarantee to have one here as well. Same thing here, it ends with one and it interpolates all the values in between. Now comes the more cool thing. So, uh, Using arrays, you can actually do uh, array expressions. So just let's create here, for example, a five by five array. Uh, I can do element wise addition. So if you have a scalar here with an array, it will uh, add on every elements three, multiplies all elements with three. You can also have use the special functions that are built into NumPy for the mathematical functions. So if you do mp.cna, it will do the sign of A for every element in A. This is also what you can do in the dot multiplication in MATLAB. So element by multiplication in MATLAB. You can also negate an array using minus in the front, that negates all values. You can also use add two arrays together. And the arrays don't have to be the same. So if the arrays are different, uh, operational small arrow will be repeated on the large arrow. Like this. So as we said, multiplication of arrays is element-wise multiplication. So it's not matrix multiplication. So how do we do matrix multiplications? That's, uh, so we can, there are a special operator for that. That's called the at sign here. You can use also the dot function. So you can do, if you want to multiply two arrays, matrix multiply two arrays, so you can do a dot a, or you can do a at a. So the at sign is matrix multiplication, and correct multiplication. Uh, in many times also, for example, in finite element, you want to, uh, for example, create a sub matrix where you remove the boundary conditions from the stiffness matrix, for example. You can use uh, something called slices or sub arrays to do that. Um, so, just to kind of repeat here, if you want to access elements inside an array, you can use the brackets here. So if it's a one dimensional, you have a single bracket. Uh, if you want to access elements, uh, the two dimensional arrays, you have a bracket row, bracket column, and you, have, you can also have the notation bracket one comma and then rows and columns. Also note that indexing starts from zero. MATLAB starts from one. Many mistakes have been made here. Uh, especially translating MATLAB code to Python. So all indexes start from zero and you, it's very hard to change that. Uh, just be aware of it. Sometimes it's hard to get over this. Matrix um, linear algebra always have the start from one. But as 
Python is based on C, they decided to go with the C notation that everything starts with zero. Yeah. And assignment, same thing, you just, just like arrays and lists, you can assign them by specifying the index and assigning a value. You can also uh, use the same kind of uh, array notation here to give a starting end between, so start and end minus one, start values between start to the end, values up to the end minus one, all values. So similar to the index notation, you can use in MATLAB as well. Um, this is also some illustration here. So you remember I have this memory array here, so you can create an array here, you can set an array and you can look at the data here as well, uh, where it's located. And, and uh, many of these index notation actually don't reallocate memory. This is a, the date attribute here is the actual memory pointer where the data starts. So in this case, I have D here, memory of D here, it points to this here, 0064. Then I have a D um, equals to one to five. And you can see here that they are located at different uh, memories here, but they basically belong to the same memory allocation. Even if there are slices of different indexes, they are still part of the same allocation. But number always tries to avoid reallocation. So this is actually where it's the starting number is located. This is the memory that has been allocated. So A here is stored at this address. B will also point to this main block of memory. It's a bit extra information, but note that it tries to avoid reallocating at all costs because usually you have a large set of data and you don't want to do this. But you can also see that if I assign different things here, you can see here this, this value is assigned in both arrays. Here are some examples of different sub arrays. Uh, here you have all elements except the last, all elements except the last two, last element of A, and then you have the, the, the notation which starts from four goes to nine with a step of two, uh, all elements of reverse four. So there are quite some powerful notations you can use here. And, and the benefits of using these notations is that you don't have to go to loops. And, most of these operations are implemented in, in the lower level language again are fast. If you, if you start using loops in, in Python or NumPy, just think before you, if you do these operations here manually, you're probably, it's a good idea to look if there is some way of doing it without the loop because that's much, much faster. faster. Uh, yeah, let's reshape this here. You can do this in two dimensional as well. So here you have, uh, all ro rows in column zero, all rows in column zero and one, row zero, rows one zero to one. And then you can do last row, for example, as well in minus, last column in D, every other row in D, and every other column. So quite powerful. Uh, yes, you can also, for example, if you, uh, have an array D, you can assign it lists. So Python will also always translate a list into elements in the array. And that, that is done transparently. So assigning a row or column with a list is perfectly okay. You don't have to assign it with an array itself. You can, you can just use lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then, then there are also some, um, as I told before, every object in Python or every variable type in Python is an object. Same thing with an array. 
there are methods associated with the array. For example, if you want to sum an array, you can call a dot sum, it will calculate the sum of all elements in the array. You can sum columns and you can sum rows as well. You can do, so in this case, you get arrays sorting of dimension zero and dimension one, and then you get uh, arrays of the sums of the well, rows of sums of the columns. Same thing, you can calculate the product of an array. Now we will get really large numbers and products of different columns as well. There is also a specialized form of an array called the matrix. Now I will just give a caveat here because um, NumPy don't want us to use matrices because they want us to use arrays and to use the, the special matrix multiplication operation. But I, I would show it anyway. The difference between a matrix and an array is that the matrix knows about linear algebra. So it has built-in operations for linear algebra. So in this case here, I have A, X, and Y, and I can do A dot T, that will return the transpose. Uh, a dot X here is a matrix multiplier. Remember, arrays using multiplication operator will be element-wise. But with a matrix object, it will be matrix multiplier. Then you have A dot I, which is a matrix inverse. So, so now you have all your arrays. Uh, perhaps you want to read them or write them in different formats. You want to perhaps export them to MATLAB or no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you want to save them in different ways. Um, the, there is a default format that you can write. It's called NPY or NPZ uh, binary that you can store to disk. Uh, it's very easy to use. You can do np.save and then you write a, give it a file name and the variable that you want to or array you want to save y and b y that gives you one file per array so if you look here i have x and py y and py and if you look at those you can see here that they're just gobbledygook so they are binary files very efficiently stored um, very useful. And you read them back again. You use the load command, and just give the file name, and then you assign an array here. So this will result in the, exactly the array that you, you saved. Y can be load, and then it will load up in the file. You can also do a combination of this. Sometimes you don't want everything to be saved in separate files. I mean, it can be, if you can have hundreds of arrays. Uh, what you can do then is actually open a file object and then ask save to write to that file. So in this case here, for example, I open the file x, y, dot, uh, write binary, so b stands for binary, supporting b, dot. You do save, and then you specify the file object f here as the first parameter, and then you have f, y here, and then it will create, append them to the file. So. First, it will write x and then it will write y. Yep. How can you store column wise in the same file, for example, store x in column one, y in column two, and so on? Um, in the same text file. There is a, com if you, uh, you can see here in the beginning, and the binary file, it actually describes what the, this, how it looks like. So uh, before, uh, as a stamp before the, Every right, there is a description on how, what the array format is, the dimension, the shape, and then it stores it just like rows. So that that information is stored for each uh, array that you store. So there's a kind of a header that comes before the file. Then you can do the other way around. So I just run, write this one here. And then you can read it again back, open the file, and then you do load from file. And then it will automatically recognize, it will read from the file, read this header. Then it will say, okay, it's 100 elements. And then it tries to read all those elements and create an array in that size that is stored. So it, NumPy will take care of every kind of the formatting of that array. So they make sure that it's the same array that you get back that is stored. So 
So I just plotted them here. You can see that I got the numbers back again. So you can also write read and write text files. Uh, so it's not always that you have the format in the way you want. You probably, perhaps you have done, done measurements somewhere. And I, I read, I guess, I got this file from revenue view, dw dot. It contains x, y, z coordinates uh, and u, v vector information here. Uh, it's stored in an array 96 by 65 by 48. So the file here has a header, two, ro two rows that we don't want to read, and then the data comes here. And so you have numbers with, uh, with spaces between them to separate the numbers. So how can we read this in, without doing our own? One option would be to read line by line and do our own interpretation of that. So split it up into different values, uh, convert them to floating point. But there is actually uh, things you can do that you don't have to do that. So there is a load text file. You read that, and then there is an option here, skip rows. So you just say, okay, the first rows I'm completely uninterested in, just skip those. And then it loads it into a UV array. And then you can see also the shape of the array here. And then you can do access. It. So then, then it's, it's a num normal number array. The alternative I have put into comments here, you can of course do this manually. So you can open the file. You can create a line here that is an empty list. You can loop over the file, uh, add things to the file, and then you have done it yourself. This is much, much faster because that is implemented in C. This is Python looping much slower. So look, look in the libraries that you have, see if you can get, there is a method for doing something. Is there a method? use it. I mean, usually those functions that are built into Python, built into NumPy are much, much faster than you, what, you, what you can write yourself. And of course, you can do that way around as well. You can do save text like this, and it will dump the array in, in the text form. So this is just a uh, it's, yeah, it dumps it in a text file in the same format that this, it's stored. So one row per array row, and then columns here. Um, you can also change the, the limiters. So it can store the values with a comma between them. So that's this option here. You can also specify a certain format. So I want four decimals instead of full precision. And you get something like this. And you can also add headers to the file. So here added this to the file as well. So quite powerful uh, if you need to read a lot, lot of text files. Yep. If you, if you save uh, a data with if you reduce the floating point of data. Then you lose precision, you lose yes. Okay. So you should only, if you, the, uh, reducing is probably something you want to do if you want to do uh, uh, present the results from calculations, for example. If you want to present in a readable way, you can reduce the number of decimal points, for example. But if you want to preserve, you should write it down with full precision or write binary files, because binary files never lose precision. Uh, you can also read and write binary files. So in this example here, I have a, let's see if I can move this. Okay. Um, So I have downloaded a file from the web called PNG. And that is an image file. And let's see if we can read that into an array in Python. So if you look at the file here, it's uh, 488,814 bytes. Uh, and you can also see here that 
uh, we use an image library, image IO here, it's a live module for reading and writing image files. And you can see here it has a 359 by 500 by three uh, elements in the array. So it's a two dimensional image where each pixel has three components, red, green, and blue. So let's see here. Um, so now we have an image here, uh, and then we need to kind of convert that to a raw file. So you can do image to file, and then it will just dump it down to disk. And then we can read it back again. So now, now we have, an, um, so PG file is just, that's already a data file. So if we, if we have a raw binary file, uh, we can use from file here to create an array. Uh, so we read that binary file. If we have a binary file, we need to tell Python what data types there is in it. So we know from, from the, well, I know from fact that every pixel data is stored as something called an unsigned integer eight. So we have to specify this one here. Then it knows uh, how many elements it should read. So if you read this here, now you can see here that we have read it into an array. It's 538,500 elements. You can see it was very quick to read this. It's unsigned integer, but now we have to reshape it into an array. And as long as we don't change the number of elements, we can do a reshape operation on it. So in this case, we do reshape 359 by 500 by three. And now it's, it's an actual a NumPy array here. And we can do plot it using matplotlib and imshow. So you can see here we have an array here and you see we get the picture back again. So we, we dumped it as a raw binary file. We write it back as a raw binary file. We reinterpret it as a 359 by 500 by three array. And then we plotted that array as an image. I think we are almost done here. Yeah, I will just quickly just say, you can also read things from, from URLs here using the data source here. Uh, and finally, solving equation systems. So NumPy has a module called linar.solve, uh, which you can take a matrix here and the right side hand here, and you'll get the solve equation system. MATLAB, or Carl Fenn for Python has a special solve ec, which is similar to the one in, in MATLAB. So that was it for today.